right, good evening, good evening, good to have everyone out. April 26th, 1995, Jesus came into my heart when I was just a 13-year-old boy. I hope you can say the same for you. 375 is a great song, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. I hope you can testify to that tonight as you stand and sing. 375, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. Let's all stand and sing. change in my life has been brought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul, now which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Blood and joy for my soul like the sea. this evening. I'm going to ask Zach Clark if he'll pray for us. All right, as you're being seated, we certainly want to welcome you this evening to our service. Certainly glad that you're here. In just a few moments, we're going to have an opportunity to see a little bit about our Kids for Truth program and how that is going, and some of these kids will get some awards and at least see some of the participation. A lot of times here, of course, on a Wednesday night, there's all kinds of things going on over here next to us, and we can't always uh, know what's going on, but we pray for them and certainly pray for fruit in their lives, and we like to see a little bit about uh, what they're doing and how that's taking place. So we're going to actually sing one more song, just a little change, not to throw you guys off. We're going to sing one more song, and then following that song, uh, Thomas Owens is going to come and uh, show us what took place in Kids for Truth. So, here we go. 708, and page 708, Jesus loves me, this I know, page 708. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, let us know. Yes, Jesus loves 
My name is Thomas, and I had the pleasure of leading the Kids for Truth program this year. And it was a lot of fun, a lot of excitement in there, a lot of energy. <laughs> Almost too much energy at times, but we were able to dial it back, and I think we had a successful year in there. And uh, I just want to give you a brief overview of the Kids for Truth program and kind of what we do over there on Wednesday nights when we are in the other building. So the Kids for Truth program, the club, is a place that the kids get to come and get to learn the Bible. And every night they come in, they get points for participating by being there. They get points for bringing their Bible to church. They get points if there's any kind of special night going on where you get to dress up. Um, they go to the back rooms where we do lesson time with them. They're separated by age groups, so they get an age-appropriate lesson. Uh, the teachers will teach them a lesson from the Bible where they get to be challenged by the Word of God and get memory verses. And they also have Bible time where they are giving, giving questions uh, about the stuff that they would have learned that night. And they go to the Bible for themselves and find the answers in the scripture for themselves and have memory verses that they're going to quote back to us. And the third part of a Kids for Truth typical night is game time, which we've seen some pretty impressive clashes in there. There's been, some, there's been a lot of fun, a lot of thrills, a lot of excitement, like we said. But... Uh, it's one of those things where when you're in there, it's just a ton of excitement. We have a lot of joy with those kids. We just, we just, we just love them to death and just see the excitement on their faces. Um, something else I wanted to, to mention before we get to the award side of this is also the, uh, well, before I get there, the store. Um, the points that they accumulate throughout the year, they're actually used in the store that we do twice a year for Kids for Truth. And they get to have all kinds of cool stuff they can buy, Nerf guns, water guns, um, doll babies. I mean, there's just a, there's a plethora of cool stuff they can get. So much so that two of our workers this year, me being one of them, were kind of jealous and were trying to buy points from some of the kids. They would not sell them for anything. They were super excited. They, they, were, they were done. They were, nope, not even interested. So they get to go to that store two times a year and use their points to buy what they want, what they've earned. They've earned those from inviting friends to church, from being there, from bringing their Bible, from learning their Bible verses. And so it's something we just like to reward the kids with. But before we get to the awards for them, I just want to thank a few people, starting with Pastor Bailey and Miss Bailey. If it wasn't for their burden for these kids, we wouldn't be able to do what we do over there. If they didn't want to have a thriving youth program where the kids can come and where they can learn the Bible at a young age, then we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And I also want to thank uh, Pastor Ethan and Nina. They trust us to help grow the future youth group you're going to have, which you're in for some good times. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank all the workers we have, the teachers, and we're going to go into detail with what teachers are in what class in a little bit, but the teachers taking time out of their schedules to learn the lessons, to come prepared, to teach the kids, and uh, just, just spend time with them, just be there kind of helping them learn their way around the Bible. And then we also want to thank the workers that aren't necessarily tied to a class, which would be workers that are kind of over different specialty areas in the program. Like I mentioned, the game time, those things have, there's stories of legend that you can hear. And that would be, we couldn't make that possible without Zach Clark, uh, Damian Adeline, and of course, Jordan Sumner. Those three have those kids all riled up and running around and good, clean, fun competition, and they just have a blast doing it. 
and we just want to thank them, and we want to thank Christy Adeline and Ryan Owens for uh, all the stuff they do on the administrative side, making sure the points are accurate, making sure people get their badges, put on their sashes and their bags, and just there's a whole lot that goes into it, a lot of moving parts, and I just want to thank every worker that we have, uh, the teachers, the helpers in the classroom, the game time, the administrative side, we just, we couldn't do it without you. I also want to thank the parents that take the time to make sure that their kids are going to be at Kids for Truth. They make sure that they get them there. Sometimes that's a sacrifice after work, you know, getting them there on a Wednesday night to where they're going to be able to go through everything and, or get them there. Uh, sometimes it's a struggle to probably go through the Bible verses, make sure that they're prepared for the lesson they're going to get. And uh, I just know there's a lot of sacrifice on the par parental side of everything. So we want to thank the parents for just being involved in, your, in, in, in that aspect of the ministry. We also want to, most importantly, thank the kids. I mean, if you guys didn't come to this, it, it wouldn't happen either. You guys make it fun for us to want to be there and to help teach you guys and pretty much to train you up using the Bible. And we just thank you so much for the excitement that you had this year. And when I said it was a success earlier, it was a su success because of you guys. You guys are what made it possible. So. Thank you guys very much for everything you did this year. So I think that's enough of me talking about all that. Let's get to why we are here. These kids did a lot of hard work, and so we want to recognize them, and we're going to recognize them because of what they've done back there in the classroom, and they're going to uh, come up by their class. I'm going to announce who the teachers were in that class, and I'm also going to let you know any extra awards they've got that they've completed. Like if they completed their book, if they had um, visitors and stuff like that. And that's what really it's all about, just recognizing the kids and everything that they did on the Wednesday nights over there. So we're going to get started with presenting the rewards. The first group that I want to call up is our youngest group. It's at three years old. This group was taught by Ms. Sue Hicks and assisted by Ms. Beth Salazar and Ms. Kimberly Reese. Oh no. <laughs> so we got Gabe Fox and Kate Fox coming up here. Thank you guys, and in this class we had one kid finish their book, and that was Kate Fox. Good job, buddy. We got a certificate for you. And we also have a goodie bag that we're gonna present to you. As a thank you for completing your book, we're gonna give that to you. You're welcome. All right. The next group we have coming up is gonna be the K-4 through first grade. It was taught by Mr. Brian Barnes and assisted by Miss Jamie Barnes and Miss Lorna Doff. And this class was attended by Esme Adeline, Joshua Danford, Peyton, Peyton Fox, pa Paxton Fox, that makes a lot more sense. I know that one. I was trying to figure out where we got a Peyton Fox from and why that was so confusing to me. Um, Ace Owens, Anna Owens, I don't know those kids' names either, um, Rhett Salazar and Jill Sumner. So that was a pretty decent sized class there. So we know uh, there was a lot of prayer going on with uh, Brother Barnes and Miss Barnes and getting their class under control and, and <laughs> ready to listen, but they did, they did great in there, a lot of book completions in there. They had nine finish their books. So the nine that are going to receive a certificate and a goodie bag is going to be Esme Adeline. Good job, Esme. Davis here. We got Joshua Danford. Good job, Good job. Ava Ellis. Paxton Fox. Good job, Pat. Ace Owens. 
Anna Owens, Silas Plowman, Rhett Salazar, and Jill Sumner. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. Our next group is the group that I was a part of. It is the second through third grade. And it was taught by myself, Miss Jim Sumner, and Miss Sarah Rhodes. And this class, we've got a lot of people missing tonight, but we are going to bring up Jamie Sumner. Jamie. And Jamie did a lot of hard work back there in that class, and she completed her book. So she is going to get a goodie bag and a certificate as well. Thank you, Jamie. Now, something a little ironic in this class is we also had Jacob Morris. And Jacob Morris has the honor of being the only kid in Kids for Truth this year to have perfect attendance. He didn't miss a single week, but he missed the award ceremony. He's not here. <laughs> but that was, that was real impressive, and we just wanted to call that out and just make sure that we could tell him, hey, you missed it, but you, you had perfect attendance, and we were going to honor you for it. So that's, that's kind of... that's. Real impressive. And our last group, which is probably our biggest group, is the fourth through sixth grade. And it was taught by Mr. Chris Rhodes, Mr. Jason Reese, Mr. Craig Brown, and assisted by Rachel Clark. And this class was attended by Gavin Avery, Marley Avery, Kinsley Urbantrout, Taylor Urbantrout, Piper Fox, Riker Fox, Gray Giggleman, Vivian. I had to look back and see where I was on my list, Vivian. I had to look for a face I knew. Vivian Rieger, Jackson Rhodes, Micah Rhodes, John Joe Salazar, Jacob Sumner, and Pearl Wright. And in this class, we had four people that finished their books, and they will receive a certificate and a goodie bag. That was Marley Avery. Good job, Marla. It was Jackson Rhodes, Jacob Sumner, and Pearl Wright. And we had six people in this group that also brought a visitor to the Kids for Truth program, which was awesome. We, we averaged probably about 32, 34 kids a night. And while averaging that, it was always... You had, you had your faithful people that were there most weeks, but then you would always have a new face. Just about every week we had a new face that was there, and it was, it was uh, pretty awesome because you'd be like, okay, well, we know so-and-so is out of town, but then you would have somebody show up. It's like, oh, awesome, it's your first time. Let's, let's have fun, let's learn. And they, they were instrumental in getting their friends here to be able to learn. And the six kids that had a visitor were Gavin, or Gavin Avery, Marley Avery, Kinsley Urbantrout, Taylor Urban Trout, and Vivian Rieger, and J.J. Reese. So good job, kids. Let's give them a round of applause, and that's a lot of hard work there. So we were excited this year to start the Kids for Truth program. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of bummed some of the kids out when we announced that was it, that we're done for Kids for Truth until the school year starts back up. And, uh, you know, you get a lot of, oh, man, all right, I guess we'll go to the regular service. No offense, Pastor. <laughs> but there is going to be a summer program for them, so they're looking forward to that. And I know some of us workers are looking forward to getting back in the Kids for Truth swing. And uh, hopefully next year will be bigger and better for us, just more kids, more learning, and more excitement, like always. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. 709, 709, if you kept your place last time, that's right down at the bottom of the page. Simple little tune, praise him, praise him. All you little children, let's all stand as we sing it. Praise him, praise him, praise him. All ye little children, God is love, God is love. Praise him, praise him. All ye little children, God is love, God is love. Love him, love him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. 
love him, love him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Thank him, thank him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Thank him, thank him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. All right, I'm going to share a couple of announcements, but right before we do, just why it's fresh on your mind, the, most of the workers take a break through the summer for Kids for Truth, and of course they appreciate that, get a little time off, but we do uh, try to come up with something through the summer as well, so the Sumners are going to help fill that, and just to give you at least a, a when and where, just so you can be aware of it, I'm going to put Jordan on the spot, he's got the same mic Thomas had. And if you would tell us uh, when it starts and what they can expect, who can, ages and et cetera, anything you want to tell us along that way. Okay, well, uh, it, we're going to take off this upcoming week, but we will start right after that. And it's going to be the same age groups of what we had before for Kids for Truth and everything. And we're going to do like an investigation kind of theme this year. And we're going to investigate the Bible for the kids each week and everything. But it'll be the same time, same place. Same bat time over in the uh, fellowship hall and everything this year. Okay, sounds good. Same ages, a little different program, just something for the summer to uh, keep them plugged in. So just be aware of that if you would. All right, let me mention too, I didn't take a lot of time to say that this morning, but I hope it's on your prayer list and I hope you're anticipating our friend day. Um, that's on June the 12th. Um, I hope you've got some folks that you're specifically uh, praying about that would be here. Now, it's great to invite somebody. I mean, I'd encourage you to invite somebody. Uh, and if you invite somebody on the spur of the moment, that's great. But I really believe you ought to put these people on your prayer list and just target them. I mean, put five people down or five couples or two or three families or at least a, a few folks. I encourage you to five is just a number, but come up with some folks and target them in prayer um, and just wait for God to open an opportunity. And then, of course, you look for an open door uh, it's good if you can give them at least two invitations. If you can go ahead of time and say, hey, we're having friend day on such and such a date. That's when they'll tell you they'll come. And then you go back to them the next time and put, hey, you remember you said you were going to come? Well, it's coming up this Sunday. So a lot of times you make that follow-up uh, uh, invitation. It's more effective than just uh, throwing it out there. So use the little cards. We've got plenty of those. We'll print some more if we need them. Uh, you may not even get to... Uh, everybody you pray for, you may not even, maybe you don't run into them, whatever, there's not an open door, but pray for that list and then look for an opportunity to, to be able to invite them. Um, and then there may be somebody that just happens to show up at the right place at the right time. Certainly the more invitations you give, the better off you are. Um, but we're targeting our friends. It is friend day. Uh, there are folks that probably ought to be in church that aren't. There may be some believers you could target, but especially, of course, uh, folks that we don't know if are saved or not. We wonder where they are. They know Christ. It's going to be an evangelistic thrust uh, during that week. Uh, but again, just a tool. Uh, we want to invite people to church all the time. That's a great thing to do, but it just gives us a tool. Hey, here's an excuse of why I'm coming to you. Uh, we hadn't talked about it for a long time, but hey, this is a good Sunday for you to visit. So just wanted to keep that in front of you uh, on the 12th of June uh, just for prayer. So do keep that in mind. Of course, we mentioned uh, next Sunday night, we'll have our Memorial Day cookout that'll start at 5. And we're just going to provide the majority of that. Again, if you want to bring a dessert or something, certainly that would be fine. But we're going to provide the food. Just so all you have to do is show up. And that'll be next Sunday evening. So if you keep that in mind, there is the Tuesday luncheon for the senior citizens group. That's Tuesday at lunchtime. If you'd like to join them for that, it's a potluck. So I'm sure they would uh, encourage you to just bring something with you to share. And uh, they'll have a good time of fellowship here. That's all I'm going to take time to mention. Let's go ahead and we'll have a, another song and then the mental company offering. Page 406, page 406, let's all stand again please, God leads us along, 406. <clears throat> Oh, 
But God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. On that third, though sorrows befall us and Satan oppose, God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season. As we take our offering tonight, I'm going to ask Chris Rhodes if he'd pray for us. Father God, it is good to be back in your house tonight and to just take a moment and, and see the, the youth program, Lord, and we're just so thankful for that, those um, little ones that you put into our care and for the document we're able to teach them and about your word. We do ask that you just bless the offering as we take it now and just bless Pastor Lord. And give us a softness of tenderness to your word that we can change our lives to reflect your son, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen.
have to do everything around this church. <laughs> All right. Take your Bible tonight, if you would, and turn over to 1 Corinthians. Let me tell you a story about a guy who left his mic on. Not that I've never done that. If you find your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, <laughs> he just found out. All right. That's all right. Yeah. But it is a, uh, a real blessing tonight to be able to see these young people and to see them not only having a program, uh, but you know, they you know, say, well, this person finished their book and this person uh, was perfect attendance and so forth. It takes some effort. Uh, for them to memorize those verses, and uh, they have challenges to them, and um, it's really a, an accomplishment, and uh, certainly a blessing to see those kids involved in that, and then of course we have our young people, we didn't even plan this for the same service, it just happened to fall this way, for our teenagers to come up and to sing, and of course the Lord has blessed us with talent, um, even in the adults, but to think that we've got upcoming talent, and uh, that wasn't just fill in space. I mean, that was good. I mean, they have, they're some talented people, and God has blessed us with that. And to think they would use that talent for the Lord um, is a tremendous blessing. Um, God is still raising up young people. And of course, we need to pray for them, pray that God would call them to the ministry, use them to be a testimony. And of course, uh, some in full-time ministry, all of them in his ministry, in whatever aspect he calls them to. So it's just a real blessing to be reminded of that. And of course, this isn't all our young people. We're just tremendously blessed to have a number of kids, and then, of course, for God to give us a youth pastor to be able to provide some leadership specifically uh, for that group. It's just really a, a blessing that we don't want to take for granted. If you find your place in 1 Corinthians 2 tonight, I do want to share some thoughts tonight from God's Word, and just uh, we've been looking through the uh, book of 1 Corinthians, and we come into chapter 2, and the, the, the theme, really, that he uh, introduced in the last part of chapter 1, he's just elaborating on that. And, of course, God has, has laid this out through the Apostle Paul. And if you find your place there in chapter 2, I'm going to read a text. But right before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you tonight that we can be in this service. And we can be reminded of the young people and the work they're involved in and that they're being trained up and a uh, challenge in spiritual truth. And Lord, we thank you for your blessing on our church. But Lord, we don't take for granted, too, these moments that we have tonight to open your word, knowing that the reason we're here is the Lord Jesus Christ and his communication of truth to us through this book. May you tonight speak to us. May you glorify yourself. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, rather, in chapter 2, Paul introduces now, as he has, if you'll remember, as we talked about this the last time, the cross, the preaching of the cross, the wisdom of this world and its insignificance and the significance of the preaching of the cross. Well, of course, the people in Corinth remembered that that was Paul's theme. Now, Paul might have been what you would call, in a sense, if you heard him in the synagogue, had you been out on the street corner, had you been in one of the places where he was sharing the gospel, and again, nobody had shared that gospel in Corinth. It wasn't just a place that he went. There were all kinds of churches. There were no churches. There were some Jews there, but of course, plenty of Gentiles. It was a wicked city, a crossroads of the world, and Paul comes in and, and goes in the synagogue to begin with, and then begins to meet people on the street, preaches where he can gather a crowd, and what does he preach but the cross? Now, the cross was a simple message. It's not complex. Jesus Christ lifted up on a cross, dying for sinners, and raised again from the dead. Now, it's a simple message, and yet he's made the case. It's a powerful message. So now he reminds these people. Now, let's not forget the underlying theme, that there are people in Corinth here that have some significant issues as far as the church is concerned. There's carnality in this church. He's going to introduce numerous problems. They're taking people to law with one another. Uh, sin is not dealt with. There's an argument over the meat offered to idols. All types of things he's going to deal with. But many of the people in the church, of course, were saved and changed and, and were thrilled about what God was doing. So now he brings them back. And he says, let me remind you of something. See, Paul had his critics. So in a sense, God is, of course, inspiring every word of this. But he's using the experience of the Apostle Paul to introduce this truth. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, 
came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, we see here Paul is really reminding these people, as he's already introduced it, but now he says, let me remind you about my message. You know, this preaching that I talked about, this cross message, it didn't impress uh, the, the philosophers of the day. You know, he stood on Mars Hill. This wasn't in Corinth, but right before he was in Athens. And he stood on Mars Hill and he saw all these idols. And of course, he had the great philosophers of his day that Mars Hill was the debating point. If a new philosopher came out and said, I've got a new theory. I mean, they didn't watch television. They didn't have uh, movies and so forth. They were looking for some type of stimulating uh, uh, entertainment. So they would go out to Mars Hill and some smart guy would get up and say, I came up with some new philosophy or a new God that I believe is out there or whatever. And the, the, the learned people would go, listen. Well, Paul stood on Mars Hill and said, let me declare unto you the unknown God. You have an altar to him down here, to the unknown God. They were so idolatrous. They had so many altars, so many different uh, idols in their city. Somebody even spoke of the place as having more idols than there were people. And they had one there just in case they'd missed one. He said, well, the one you missed is the one I declare to you. Let me tell you about him. Well, the philosophers listened that day. And they said, boy, he seems to be to set her, uh, setting forth a strange God. We'd like to know more about this simply intellectually. Well, Paul could stand shoulder to shoulder with any scholar. I mean, his testimony was he had sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which was the best known, uh, it was the, the Yale University of teaching Pharisees that day. And he was graduated at the top of his class. Uh, he was headed for the Sanhedrin. He was a, uh, a, 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 in the Jews' religion, a prophet, he said, above many of his equal. Intellectually, Paul had the ability to stand shoulder to shoulder with all the modern philosophers of that day. But he said, when you heard me preach, you remember what I preached? I just got up and said, Jesus died for your sin. He rose again from the dead. Will you receive him? And you know what happened? Great blessing followed his efforts. A church began. People were saved. But he said, when I was with you, I didn't use excellent speech. It wasn't that he couldn't. He said, uh, I, didn't, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ. In verse 3, he actually goes in a little bit and he says, look, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and in power. You see, the fact is, Paul had a singular message. Now, he preached this message to the lost, and he said, look, I'm not trying to impress. He said, I'll be honest with you. I stood up and preached, and I had fear, and I had trembling. You ever been a little afraid to share the gospel with someone? You ever wondered how they were going to take it? A lot of people have a fear of speaking in public. In fact, most people do when you become the center of attention. Now, I've preached so many times and been in the pulpit so many times I don't really know that I get nervous per se as long as I'm preaching. But you get me outside of preaching. I'm, I get nervous in the announcements. Uh, yesterday, I did a wedding. I am totally out of my element in a wedding. I mean, that's a script. You know, I've got the thing written ahead of time, and I, boy, if I mess this up, uh, everybody's watching. Uh, you say, well, that doesn't bother you after doing all this year. Sure, I still get nervous about that. But once we get into the Bible... I know God's got something to say, so I just can step out and say, okay, God, do what you will. Paul said, I was in fear and trembling, but I knew the message would do the job. You know, Paul was even uh, spoken of by his critics as a person who was not a flowery uh, orator, that he didn't have great ability to communicate truth in the sense that he would make you spellbound, but his intellect was tremendous, and they knew he was smart, but he said, even though I had that intellect, he said, I didn't want to depend on that. I didn't want to depend on the fact that I had used such huge vocabulary and such spellbinding uh, uh, words and things that people thought, wow, this guy's greatly learned. He said, if I had and it worked, you might think that's the reason that God did something. He said, I just came in simplicity. There was a great uh, Bible teacher years ago whose name was Dick Wilson. Dick Wilson, it is said of him, and I believe he gave this in some type of perhaps an autobiography, but the, uh, the, the stage of his life, he looked at early on when he was in college, he says, you know, Moses, 
uh, had his life set up in, in three phases. Of course, he was in Egypt for 40 years. And then God trained him in the wilderness for 40 years. And then for 40 years, or on the backside of the desert, then for 40 years, he led the people. He says, you know, if I live a normal lifestyle, um, I've got about 60 years perhaps left. He said, I'm going I'm to I'm break my life up into 20-year segments. For 20 years, he studied the original languages of the Bible, became a tremendous linguist on Hebrew and Greek, studied them in depth, so he became a great authority. He said, after 20 years of studying the language in detail, I'm going to spend the next 20 years using that knowledge to really study and understand everything I can about the Bible. And then he said, if God gives me the last 20 years, I'm going to use that to expound that knowledge and teach it to people and so forth. That was his anticipation when he was a young man. Well, he set out to do that, and he was a great scholar and well-known, well-respected uh, scholar of Hebrew and Greek and so forth. He studied the Bible tremendously, and of course he didn't wait completely till 40 years was up to give lectures. He was known all along as a very learned person, but he really focused on that last 20 years and began to teach and so forth. And and when he was up in age and toward, toward the end of that time, and had people had kind of knew that about him, he gave a great lecture one time on the, uh, on the, uh, the infallibility of the Bible, how, how sure he was that it was true, and how every word of it was from God. And he was a tremendous fundamental Bible-believing man. But he gave a lecture on the Scripture, and when he got done, having studied the Bible all of these years, and this lecture was much anticipated, at the very end of it, he finished his lecture and basically said something in essence like this. I've studied this Bible. I've studied the Hebrew language. I've studied the Greek. I've gone through it for years. I've poured into it. And he said, here's what I've found. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. You know, you can't sum it up much better than that. And you can't be much more simple than that. You say, boy, that's a great song for children, but it's a great truth for everybody. I know Jesus loves me because what does this Bible teach me? But it points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I was simple. My message was singular. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then he does go on and say his message was not only singular, but as you might expect, it was a superior message. Now he says down in verse uh, 6, he says, how be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Now, before he's saying, I didn't use wisdom. In other words, I wasn't trying to imp impress anybody with how smart I was or how deep or how great a knowledge I had. I just wanted to preach Jesus and preach the gospel and tell people how to be saved. However, how be it, we did preach something that was extremely wise and deep, but he said only to those that are perfect. Now, you see the word perfect, you know it doesn't mean sinlessly perfect. Um, if we preach to those that are perfect, we wouldn't have a very large congregation, okay? Uh, wouldn't be anybody in it. He's not talking about sinlessly perfect. What he means here is mature, full grown, those that are what they ought to be, those that were seeking truth. You wouldn't preach this to the lost, they wouldn't understand it. But he said, after we got some folks saved, and they began to really thirst after God and wanted to know he said, we did give him wisdom. Now, he has been, as I said before, using wisdom sort of in quotes, the wisdom of this world. It really isn't all that wise. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And that's really what this world says, isn't it? They may not be atheists. It's not so much that the atheist says in his heart, there is no God. Sure, they do that. But even people who say, yeah, I believe there's a God, they still say, no God for me. Yeah, he's up there, he's there, but I'm really not, unless I need him, I'm not concerned about him. They claim a certain kind of wisdom. Now, he's saying, in quotes, yeah, their wisdom was not wise. God's greater. But now he's really talking about true wisdom. We did preach wisdom to them that were perfect. Yet, not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now notice in verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, there's a, there's a point, of course, in this church that obviously our, our message, our, 
our goal, what we want to communicate, what we want to exemplify, what we hold as our great banner is the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, we would not want to uh, impress the world. Boy, if you come here, you're going to be greatly um, academically challenged. And you just, you know, we have great minds here. And boy, if you come, we can really tantalize your uh, brain because we give you such deep stuff that you walk out and say, boy, I'm, that was so deep, I don't even understand what he meant. I mean, that's not the message we hold out. We hold out Jesus, crucified, risen, coming again. You need to receive him. That's what we exemplify. But to those that seek to know the Lord, there is truth that is precious to the believer that none of these princes of this world could understand if you told them. They wouldn't grasp it if you explained it. And yet it is necessary for us as believers, there's some blessed truth that we can grasp only after we're saved. Now, just turn over for a moment, because Paul's going to get to this point, just a page, over to chapter 3. And notice what Paul says now as he, he gets to this point to them. He says, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, or the complete type believer I'm talking about, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. He was saying, look, we had to preach the cross, and the cross got you saved. He said, but you know what? Those that are trying to grow, there is something for you. There's some blessed truth. And you know, there's more to being a Christian than just knowing that I'm going to heaven. There's some things God's got to show us besides just the fact, well, I'm saved now and just waiting for him to come. No, there's some blessing right now, some wisdom that God wants to impart, and Paul calls it a mystery. Now, the mystery is already revealed, but it's only going to be revealed by God. The world has no clue. Let me give you a couple of things that, that the world really would never grasp. They have no concept of. To them, they view it as religion, and even if they understand salvation, to them it's just a matter of, well, God you know, saves some people, they go to heaven, other people are lost, they go to hell. So that's Bible truth. But they don't understand the position that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, the only way a, a person could grasp that is the Holy Spirit of God would reveal through his word and through his spirit what it means to be in Christ. I mean, you know, a lost man, if I told him today that I'm in Christ, he'd think I was speaking in a parable. He'd think I meant that figuratively. I don't mean it figuratively. I'm literally in Christ. Now, this old flesh is not, you know, obviously it's something that's spiritual, but it's not symbolic. I'm in Christ. But then if you listen to me long enough and I keep preaching this Bible, you're going to hear me say that Christ is in me. Now, they may not view that as much symbolic. They may think that somehow in some religious way that I think that God has moved inside of me. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. How could we put him in a, in a house? You can't put him in a house but yet, he lives in the hearts to save people. I mean, behold him, the, the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, lives in my heart. So now think about it. I'm telling you Jesus lives in me. And then I'm telling you that I'm in him. You know, for me to use human language and explain that, other than to tell you what God says, I can't. But I, in a sense, by God's spirit, understand what that means. I, it's a position. I'm baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Uh, let me show you. We've preached through Ephesians in, the, in Sunday mornings, and we've touched on this, but I want to just show you real quick. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, just a few pages to the right. Just go over to Ephesians 1 for a moment. This is the same thing that Paul was, was praying for. We just recently, just a month or so ago, we're dealing with this very truth, but in Ephesians chapter 1, and in verse 17, he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What will happen if you did that? Well, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to working of his mighty power. When he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and yet goes on to tell us that I'm seated 
with him in the heavenlies. Now, Christ is in me. I'm in him. And he's seated in the heavenlies. And I'm seated with him there. And yet he's still using me here on this earth. Do I grasp that in the sense of human understanding? No, but does the Spirit of God give me that truth? And somehow inside of me, I think, boy, isn't that a wonderful position? Isn't that something? If that's true, what might God do through me? What might he, how might he influence the world if I'm with him in that kind of way? Look over to chapter 3. Very similarly, again, he uh, has this prayer in verse 16 of chapter 3, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend. With all saints, what is the breadth and length and depth and height? And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Now, you can go back to 1 Corinthians 2. But understand now, Paul is saying, we do preach wisdom to the full grown. To those that are perfect, sure, there's more to it than the cross. Yeah, there, the cross saves us, and there is something. And he's saying to these Corinthians, I couldn't give this to you. You know what? One of the great detriments to a church becoming divided, is first of all, the message of the cross is going to be hindered. In other words, a church that's divided is not really interested in reaching the lost. They're pretty well wrapped up with the drama that's going on in their church. I've seen that happen. You have too. I mean, it consumes you. The only thing they're worried about next Sunday is who's going to be there, what kind of confrontation might take place. The spiritual people basically say, I don't even really want to be there. And they're not really that interested in reach, preaching the gospel. Not only that, even if the gospel maybe is going out and you say, well, they're still preaching and you know, maybe God's working that way. They're not going to be spiritually minded. They're still going to be, uh, be fed with milk. But there's some things they need to know that would be a tremendous blessing to them. See, the Spirit of God reveals this. Now notice in verse 9, as it is written, he quotes the book of Isaiah, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now Isaiah was telling the Old Testament saint, you have no idea what God has in store for believers. We often use that as an application, and it's a valid application. Um, we still don't know everything that heaven's going to be. That what God has prepared for us that love him. He has prepared a place for us. And I can assure you that not everything that he's going to give us in heaven and everything we have there is completely revealed in the Bible to the point that we read some of it over in Revelation 21 and so forth. And we think, boy, it's going to be wonderful, but I don't know what all it'll be. There's questions that are unanswered. But really what his ultimate point here was is the Old Testament saint didn't know. But as a New Testament saint, I can know. Look, if you would, in verse 10. God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. You see, he had a singular message of the cross. He had a superior message. He said, I've got some wisdom to give you. Yes, it really is wisdom. I've got some things to show you as a believer that could thrill your soul, that God wants to show you that really what he's done for you on this earth, the exalted position of the church. He said, I've got something to show you. But he said, I've also got a spiritual message. God hath revealed it unto us by his spirit. Now, you'll notice if it says, what, uh, what man knoweth the things of a man? Save the spirit of man which is in him. What is the spirit of man? In this sense, not, not the spirit of God. The spirit of man is you. Now, I, I, I can see your body right now, and I, I can look you in the eye, and I can talk with you, and I can, in a very real sense, saying I'm speaking to Sam Brown. Since there's not a Sam Brown that I know of in here, I'll use him as an illustration. I almost said Craig Brown, but I won't do that. Sam Brown, okay? So I'm speaking to Sam Brown, and he looks, I mean, that's him. It's his body. I shake his hand, talk to him. That's him. But you know that if he were to depart and die, death is separation, the body's still there. But even a lost man knows that's not Sam Brown. It's, that's his body. Where's Sam Brown? That's his spirit. That's the part of him that he may, he may be dead spiritually, 
But he's talking about the real person, essentially, him. It's got to live somewhere forever. Sam Brown's going to live in heaven or live in hell for all eternity. And of course, that's going to be based on his relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Who really knows a man? Save the spirit of a man. I mean, you might know about me, but a spirit, I mean, my own self, I kind of know myself, but you know there's one that knows me just a little better than I know myself. The spirit of man in the book of Proverbs is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. God actually knows more than I do. He tells me in the word of God actually can reveal the thoughts of my heart that I didn't even know I had. Now, he illustrates that by saying, if that's the case, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, God, this is God's illustration, not mine. If the Spirit of man, it kind of lets me know that that's the real me. Not that this body is the real me too. I'm a three-part person. God is a trinity. And the Spirit of God lives inside of me. He reveals to me spiritual truth. Spiritually discernible truth. A spiritual message. Now, I want to hit real quickly. We're almost out of time. But notice now, lastly, it is also a syllabic message. You know what a syllabic message is? A message with words. Literally, God inspired the words of the Bible by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God can speak to my heart, but how does He do it? Look in verse 13. Which things also we, that's the apostles, speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Do you know that the Bible is not just an inspired group of thoughts? It's not that the Apostle Paul was so close to God and he was in a position of, of apostolic authority and he, because he just knew a lot about the Bible and God had maybe taught him some things, that he just decided to write an epistle called 1 Corinthians or Galatians or Ephesians or Philippians or Colossians, etc. Or that Isaiah the prophet just said, well, you know, I'm so familiar with Israel and all the things that are going on and God's given me a lot. I'm going to just write a book called Isaiah. That's kind of what the... Uh, worldly wisdom, maybe even, they even think it's not even that, but they think that the concepts are probably from God, but the man just kind of decided what to write. Paul's making it very clear right here that God gave him the words. The very words that are written, God gave them. You say, well, how could the Apostle Paul, he had to be the person to write a chapter like chapter 12, twice, thrice I've been in the deep, I was beaten with rods. That's God's providence. God knew exactly where Paul would be, what he would experience, and who was going to write that book. Yes, he used their vocabulary, their experiences, but I believe every word in this Bible is from God. Amen. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, holy men of God spake as they were moved. That word moved means like a ship holding cargo. He picked them up and took them exactly where he wanted them to go, every word. And I believe everything in this book because God put it there. He's not saying that the things we speak, the concepts which man teaches, but the very words. These words are specific. Now, Paul was claiming authority from these words, spiritual words, and that was his message. His message was very much a singular message of the cross. It was a message that certainly was superior because he said God's wisdom is greater than the world's. It was a message that was spiritual because you can't understand it apart from the Holy Spirit, but God does want to show us and then, of course, this specific message, that is the very syllables that God gives us, that was his message, and that's the message of this book. Let's go ahead and stop there tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word and for giving us such a tremendous message, the message of the cross of Christ, and then the, uh, the truth of understanding where we are really as believers in you. Lord, we want to be the, that believer that grows, that reaches a point where you can speak to us and teach us and draw us closer to yourself. Lord, we think of this church that Paul wrote to as, a, in a sense, a negative example in that they didn't have and weren't learning and weren't catching everything that God had for them. Lord, may we take that admonition ourselves to have an open heart and to seek unity and to seek your spirit and power and trust you'll get glory through it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing an invitation hymn tonight.
548 is our song. If you're here tonight and maybe you don't know Christ as your Savior, it'll be a wonderful time for you to come to Him. You meet me here at the front, I'll have someone take a Bible, show you how to be saved. If God's spoken to you, maybe God's even speaking to you and you say, you know what, Paul uh, was, had fear and trembling and I do too, but God's called me. I believe God wants me to serve Him and I'm going to surrender to Him. You can always come and Say, preacher, I believe God's called me to serve him full time. We'd be thrilled to know it. If God spoke, you come, 548. Have you any room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin. As he knocks and asks admission, Sinner, will you let him in? Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now his word obey. Swing the heart's door widely open. Bid him enter while you may. Amen, amen. Well, the service has been a real blessing tonight. Tremendous to see these young people and their involvement and to be able to fellowship. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our service in prayer. Brother Joey Potter, would you close us, please?